was a longtime benefactor of the mathematics department at Humboldt State. He was a professor at HSU from 1966 until his, no, sorry, sorry. He retired in 1978, so he was here for over 13 years. He earned his bachelor's in physics and mathematics from Cornell, where there's also a Keyball lecture and Keyball scholarship. He earned his PhD from the University of Cincinnati, another Ohio connection to Humboldt, where there was also a Keyball scholarship and Keyball lectureship. He went on to teach at the State University of New York, Brooklyn College, the University of Arizona, and Humboldt State University. He retired to Ashland, Oregon, um, never having taught at Southern Oregon State College, but you can see from the uh, picture that this was a timely gift, it's a sundial, um, made to Southern Oregon State College. Well, I also have evidence, well, we could all just walk right outside and see that he made an identical gift of a sundial to Humboldt State University, but I did, in pulling out the Keyball um, information that I had, find this picture of my colleagues and I, um, yeah. and I don't know if it's going to come in, but Dale Oliver, who's in there, assures me that that was his first year on the faculty here. That <laughs> makes it my second year on the faculty here. That goes back to about 91 or 92, standing around the sundial. And um, so we thank Harry for all he has done for Humboldt State University. We have an annual Keyball scholarship of $2,000, or if it's shared, it's a $1,500 each scholarship. And the scholars this year are Annie Adams and Gina Karuna Rotney. Are either of them there here? They shared last year's scholarship, or, or they're the, the reigning outstanding senior math majors at Humboldt State. Um, he also left us enough to construct a Keyball classroom in Siemens Hall. And that has since become acquired by the university. We no longer have ownership of the great Keyball classroom. But if you ever make it down to Siemens Hall 128, check out the floor plan. It's great. Uh, it's got a little mathematical design to it. Um, where am I? I had more to say. No. And so let's get on with it. Forgive me. Um, at this time, we are going to have the 65th semi-annual Keyball lecture. The lecturer will be introduced by HSU's provost, Jenny Zorn. Jenny is, um, has been educated in Ohio herself. She has bachelor's and master's degrees in geography from the Ohio State University. And uh, she's going to introduce our speaker tonight. So please welcome uh, provost, Jenny Zorn. Yes, in, in fact, I was just um, saying how this is kind of bringing me back to my roots. Uh, I was, uh, the geography department at Ohio State was the heart of the quantitative revolution back in the 60s and 70s in the discipline of geography. And so my advisor when I got there was the king of quantitative geography. So in fact, our master's program in geography had more quantitative methods uh, we took Fortran, uh, those sorts of things, than geography classes. <laughs> um, to, to some people's chagrin that we shouldn't be doing that. But, uh, so I have a, a very strong quantitative background uh, through that. And so I'm really honored to be able to come and, uh, and welcome our visitor here for the Keyball Lecture. So she is uh, from Stanford. And this is, um, as was indicated, it is um, each semester the mathematics department invites a noteworthy speaker to the department to give this lecture. And sh this lecture this year is Dr. Margo Garrison, who's an associate professor of energy resource engineering at Stanford. And she's the director of the Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering at Stanford. She's originally from Netherlands earning her PhD in scientific computing and computational mathematics from Stanford in 1996. And she specializes in renewable and fossil energy production, including computational methods to predict the performance of enhanced oil rec recovery methods, and is also active in ocean coastal dynamics. She's received numerous awards, 
a couple of which are the Society of Women Engineers Professor of the Year at Stanford last year, and in 2011, the School of Earth Sciences Award for Excellence in Teaching at Stanford. She also has been involved in seemingly disparate areas such as yacht research, the design of search algorithms, and Terrasar flight mechanics. What do those topics have in common? Linear algebra. <laughs> and tonight, Dr. Erickson, Erickson will tell us about what makes the equations of linear algebra not merely useful, but also able to produce beautiful images. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, hopefully this works. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yeah? Okay, so let me know if, uh, and you're switching the light off. See, every, everybody's working together. So it's a real honor for me to be here. I've had a wonderful day so far. Uh, you know, I will tell all my Stanford colleagues that if you go to HSU, they make you work very hard. Uh, because I had to come into a lecture and then gave a talk this afternoon and now this one uh, as well. So hopefully I'll stay awake for it and hopefully you do too. Uh, <laughs> but I see quite a few people who were in the talk also this afternoon and I think that all the math instructors that are near the front of the audience should make a record of your name and give you extra credit for <laughs> spending you know, the afternoon and the evening uh, listening to me uh, pontificate about linear algebra and math and, and his oil recovery. Now, I am a longtime lover of algebra. And when I tell people, including my son and his friends, he's 15 now, that you know, algebra is absolutely fantastic, he also looks at me as if I'm completely weird. Now, he thinks I'm weird anyway, but you know, completely weird. And it's no surprise, because if, if we believe Google to have the universal truth, right, then when you, um, oh, come on. Uh, sorry. I, uh, for some reason, it doesn't want to, oh, there you go. So when, when you, uh, well, hopefully this will work out, we'll see. So when you use Google and you type in, for example, math beauty, this is what you get. Um, it does say mathematics possesses supreme beauty, but then it goes on to say a beauty cold and austere. And this is the constant thing we're fighting. I don't think so. I actually think the beauty of mathematics is warm and passionate and wonderful. And so hopefully I'll convince you of that. And then you go a little bit further. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Okay, don't know why this happened. And then you say, okay, algebra, what about algebra? Now, apparently, according to Google, the first uh, search page, the two people in the world who think algebra is beautiful, that's Khan and me, yeah. okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you say algebra beauty, you get the Khan Academy. No, I know Khan, he's in our area. And then you have me with a talk, say, the beauty I see in algebra. So obviously, there are two weird people around, which I'm going to tell my son. It's not just me, but it's also Khan, right? Um, but hopefully, by the end of tonight, you will be convinced that algebra is actually very beautiful, because I'm going to show you how to create art like this. Now, is this useful mathematical art? I really don't know. But who cares? Right? I mean, art doesn't necessarily have to be useful. Actually, some of the things that we do with this are very useful um, after some training. Um, but it's just one example. Of course, algebra is beautiful in, in because of its applications also, and, and that's another thing I want to show you, and very useful, and there is beauty in usefulness, and I'm going to show that to you, the usefulness of linear algebra, by looking actually at how Google searches work. So what I just this math uh, did, uh, ma typing in math beauty and getting a search result, that is all driven by linear algebra. So you use it every day. Okay? So at the end of tonight, you should be able to go home, say, understand it a little bit, at least I hope so, and I absolutely am convinced of the at least the usefulness, right? and hopefully also a little bit of the beauty. Now this picture here is actually uh, algebra underlying music put into visuals by my friend Tim Davis. And I don't know if you can read this, but it's notesartstudio.com, or you can just Google Tim Davis linear algebra and you get his uh, amazing art. 
But you know, the problem is when you start talking about algebra, the very first thing um, I will really have to do is take you back to the classroom, okay? So, because first we have to do a little bit of mathematics. So there's no blackboard in this room, but we create one, okay? Um, and I'm going to do a linear algebra class. So I'm going to give you a couple of equations to solve. Now, how many of you remember how to solve this from high school? Well, most, most, right? So, so this could have been a question at high school saying, hey, I have three unknowns, x, y, and z, and they're related this way. x plus y is 2, y minus z is 0, and x plus y plus z is equal to 3. And the question is, what are x, y, and z? Now, maybe you say, okay, no problem for me, right? It's just, say, okay, take one of the equations, express x in terms of y, and then I have this, and then I play a little bit with with the second equation, say z and y are equal, and then I plug both of that into the last equation, and I got this. Can you follow so far? Right, excellent, good. Um, and then you solve for y, and it turns out y is 1, and you know x is 1, and z is 1. So fine, okay, we, we can solve this. But the question, of course, is what really are x, y, and z? You know, what are these things? Uh, because underlying these equations must be some sort of physics, right? Or some sort of engineering problem, some sort of like, interesting problem that gives you this system of equations. So when, when you look at this, these equations, what you have to realize is that they identify, give you relationships between x, y, and z, whatever x, y, and z are. And relationships and connections between entities are everywhere in the world, right? If I want to compute a fluid flow, then the velocity at some point is completely dependent on how much pressure, or how big a pressure gradient I have to push that flow. There's a relationship between velocity and the difference in pressure, right? The physical relationship. If I model this and write this down, I get something like this. Um, you'll see later that if I do a search, in Google, actually, I create relationships between documents, and compare and contrast them. And there's so many different applications and, and uh, areas where equations are used because they express relations and connections. So from now on, every time you see equations, don't freak out and say, oh my goodness, that's algebra and I have to solve it. Just think, okay, I've got relations between variables, you know, whatever they may be. And these come up in so many different areas, right? If you predict stock prices, you have equations. Computing heat flow in, in this theater, for example. Suggesting movies in Netflix. Searching for relevant, relevant websites. Optimizing design of an aircraft wing. All things that I've worked on. Positioning of goods in grocery store. I worked on that when I was a student. Did I make some money? But no, not mathematically. Um, and, for example, predicting whether it will rain in Arcata tomorrow, that's also all about relations and equations. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, and now, you know, you say, well, I, I know this from high school, and now the nightmare scenario occurs. You come into a class and they give you a system like this and say, go and solve it. Right? And when I... When I asked my, my, uh, my boy, who is 15, I said, what is the worst thing that could possibly happen to you when you go to high school tomorrow? And he said, if they get a horrible system of equations that I have to solve in two minutes. So here it is. Now, the, you know, we don't actually solve systems like this. Most of the systems that we work with are very, very large and very, very messy, just like this one. And we never solve this but with pen and paper. You know, we write computer programs to help us. But we cannot write a program if it looks like this. You know, when you write computer programs, everything needs to be very, very structured and organized. So before we write, we start using relationships and connections. And remember, in all of these applications I talked about, we have equations, sometimes millions of equations like this, and millions of unknowns. We first rewrite and write this in a very, very structured way with something called a matrix. And so I'd like to introduce matrices to you now. Because we're going to play with that. All the art that you've seen so far are based on these matrices. And matrices are the, the, the big things behind this linear algebra. OK, so we're going to go back to the initial system of equations. But now I write it much neater. And I write it so that all x's in every equation are right ni nicely underneath each other. And all y's are underneath each other. And all z's are underneath uh, each other. OK? 
Okay, so this looks much better. And then I see, well, this is funny actually because in equation number two, I don't have an X and in equation number one, I don't have a Z. So I'm going to fill this in because I'd like to find for every equation the same pattern. This much times X plus that much times Y plus this much times Z is equal to something. Okay? And so X and Z are missing, so I'm going to put them in simply by saying, okay, that was obviously zero times. So now every equation has the same pattern. It's something times x plus something times y plus something times z is equal to something else. Every single equation is the same. Really neatly written. Mathematicians love this when you have patterns like this and structure, okay? And, and we're gonna do it a little bit better still. Uh, now we have zero x and we should really put in a plus. And then when we just have x and y, that's really one times. So I'm gonna explicitly write this down. Okay, so this is now the system I have. And now I'm reasoning like this. You know, think about these are 10, maybe this is a, the actual system that you're solving is 10 million unknowns and 10 million equations. And every single one I write down sometimes times, something times x plus something times y and so on. And I write x down a lot and I write y down a lot and I write z down a lot. And of course, if I had 10 million, I wouldn't use x, y, z. I would call them something else because I run out of, the alphabet pretty quickly, right? I could only do 26 equations otherwise, but we do things that are much bigger. So I have a slightly different system, but for now, let's just stay with this. So what I'm gonna argue is that, hey, X occurs always at the same place, Y always at the same place, Z always at the same place. I don't actually have to write them down. I just need to remember in what order they appear. And the only thing I really need to remember about the system is what are these coefficients? I need to remember the order of x, y, and z, so I store that somewhere. I'm going to store this in a vector, and I need to remember the coefficients in front of them. Okay, so instead of writing it like this, I take x, and I throw x, if this wants to work. <laughs> I'm supposed to see x go into something here. Yep, there you go. x goes into a vector, y goes in with, with x, and I store that together in a little column of three values, and that is called a vector. And then I have the coefficients left, and of course I don't have to store all the pluses either, right? I just write everything as an addition, and so where I had a subtraction, I just write plus minus one, minus one now becomes the coefficient, I'm, I simplify it even more, so that's all I really need to know, and to distinguish between the coefficients and the storage of the variables, I just write little brackets around it. And instead of this system of equations I had earlier, I now have what we call in algebra a matrix vector equation. Right? This is exactly the same as I had before by definition. And this thing here, this thing, this, the table of coefficients, that is called the matrix. Now you probably re realize how incredibly um, famous these matrices are, right? Because they even made movies out of it, right? <laughs> the matrix, right? So that was, that was this thing. And it, it, I always have to laugh because every time I, I watch the matrix and watch this with Callum, Morpheus in this movie at some point says, the matrix is everywhere, even here in this very room, right? And so I want you to feel this, this vitality of this matrix, right? It's everywhere. So these matrices, these are just tables of coefficient, represent, all of them, system of equations, and these equations represent physical systems. So for us as linear algebraists, every physical system or engineering system or social problem or political problem, whatever problem we work on, ultimately, in our view, becomes this, right? And so we look at this, and these matrices are sometimes really big, and we can't really diagnose them or identify features in them very easily when there are many, many numbers. But this is the physics, right? This is it. Just a bunch of coefficients. For us, they represent all this underlying physics. And in linear algebra, we play a lot with these matrices. And one of the things that we're gonna play with is how to create beautiful pictures out of them, right? How, how do we visualize these matrices? How do we make them come alive? Okay. 
Now, the interesting thing is, as I said, equations and relations and connections, they appear almost everywhere. You know, no matter what field you're in, even fields that are absolutely unrelated, you think to physics and engineering, you're probably dealing with connections or relations that could be between people, could be between entities. And so as a mathematical modeler, I see, oh, I can write equations for that, right? And that's what we try to do, right? We, we write models for human behavior. Guess what? It's a bunch of equations. It's a matrix. So these matrices, again, for us, are very much alive, right? And we work with them all the time. Now, let me give you just a couple of examples from the Institute that people have worked on. And one example is uh, to do with the, with the bay. Uh, so you have to go south a little bit from where you are and go to San Francisco Bay. So let me show you this. And here what you see is a simulation of tidal flow in and out of San Francisco Bay. So I couldn't find anything closer uh, to Humboldt here. Okay? So velocity vectors are drawn, tidal flow going in and out, and the colors indicate the magnitude of the velocity. Right? The, the redder, the higher the velocity. And these look very nice, and when I look at them, I know that underlying this was one really big, horrible matrix that I had to deal with, right? And, and had to write code for. And how do we get a, a matrix out of this? Now, this is, a you think, a fluid flow problem. You know, there's, there's water mass flowing in and out. How can we model this that, with, with equations you know, and relationships? So this is how we, we do it. We distribute a whole bunch of points over these domains. Okay? So in here, the points are chosen to be the vertices, the endpoints of triangles. So all these little points here are points in which I decide I want to know approximately what is the velocity, what is the pressure, what is the salinity, what are other flow characteristics. Okay? Not in every single point, so that would be too hard. Now, I cannot find closed form solutions here or analytical expression, but I'm going to find approximate solutions in just this point. And this is called a computational grid. Let's move, you know, zoom in a little bit. So if you're looking close up, these, this is what these triangles may look like. And at each of these points here, we're interested in finding solutions. Okay, so let me label these points. Here are a bunch of them. And in every point, I want to know pressure, velocity, and say salinity. But here's the trick. Laws of physics relate pressure between two neighboring points. No, I cannot have a pressure here completely disconnected from a pressure there. They're connected to each other through the medium, right? And this physics underlying it. To have high pressure here, very likely that later or already now, this pressure here will also be relatively high. If I have high pressure here and low pressure ne nearby, there will be very high velocity in between. If you have very high pressure, very low pressure, it sets up a flow. So you can see between all these points, I will be able to find relations between these entities. And if I can find relations, I can find equations. If I have equations, I have a matrix. Okay? So this is represented by a matrix. Now, what does a matrix like that look like? It's very, very large. And I cannot really look at this and say, here are all the numbers. So instead, what we do, and this is the simplest visualization. You may not agree with me that this is pretty. I, I still think it's pretty, but you know, maybe I am completely, utterly weird. Right? But what we've done now is this. Imagine this is big table, and there's lots of coefficients floating around, but also lots of zeros, because points that are very far away, you know, one end of the bay and the other end of the bay, will probably not be related. You know, it's only the points close to each other that are related. And so the coefficients there are zeros. So there's lots of zeros. And what we do is every time there is a non-zero in this table or the matrix, we put a little dot for a non-zero. And if it's a zero, we don't put anything. So here we see the pattern of connectivity, all the non-zeros that were there. In one of the equations, we had y minus z is zero. x did not appear. So there will not be a dot for x in that, in that relation. Now, when we do visualization like this, we call this a spy matrix. And there are programs that can visualize this for us. Now, here's another example. Um, and this is done by a friend of mine who is now moving to Stanford. She's currently at UCSD. And does, she does aorta flow modeling. Right? So she's very interested in blood flow through the aorta and the arteries. 
And the domain is all given by MRI images for every uh, individual patient. And she does flow just like in San Francisco Bay, but now in, in this area. And she also puts triangles in with points in which she wants to know relationships between the blood, blood, blood pressure and velocities and, and other types of characteristics of blood. So very, very similar problem. Now, it may, it may seem a completely different application, but again, it leads to relations. Relations lead to equations. Equations lead to matrix. This is what that matrix looks like as a spy plot. Now here's another example, and that's with, with searching. And you may wonder, how do matrices come up when you're searching? So this is a very Stanford-inspired example. Okay, so I don't know how, how well you know this, but Stanford and Berkeley are competing you know, very often. And one of the things that we do every year is play football against each other. And then we have the X that you can win or lose, right? Now we're, we've been beating Cal many, many times. So this is just reinforcing that. So here are five websites, ESPN, there's a baking website, there's a Berkeley website. Uh, I think there's some, what is the other one? The Muppet Show or something. And then uh, TEDx, where I was at the time when I gave this talk. And what Google does, and you see that a little bit later, it stores all the unique words in the document. Now, I'm just going to pick out a few as illustration, OK? <laughs> right? So completely random uh, three words out of the document. right? And it stores those. For every website, it has a list of all the words that occur in this website. OK? And then we go to another uh, web page, and we may see some other words. Um, so for example, this cooking website also has beating and eggs. Uh, so there's some sort of connection between cattle and eggs, right? And then the Berkeley website has California in it. Um, and then the TEDx website at Stanford has Stanford in it. So now these are just five websites and five web pages and four words. But you can imagine that for the millions of words that are in the English dictionary and that are unique and may occur in websites, and for the billions of web pages that are there, you could create a table that simply gives a one at the position where in the row, in this case, every row corresponds to a word, is a word. And if that word is in that web page, then it gets a one, right? And if the, that word, for example, eggs, was not on the ESPN website, that gets a zero. Okay? So it builds up this big table of ones and zeros that really give you all the information about the internet. Right? Now, this is, called, this is called the term document matrix. The documents are the websites, and the terms are the words. And of course, in reality, that is not a matrix or a table that has 20 elements in it like this one, but it is a table that has 10 million by 22 billion. And so it's absolutely massive. But what we see as linear algebra is, what do you think? It's just a matrix, you know, with ones and zeros. What do these matrices look like? Well, they may have patterns like this, okay? So matrices occur everywhere. And then when you start talking about linear algebra, people say, well, what are your favorite matrices? And some people will say, well, I like matrices that have lots of zeros. So that's in the top left corner. Other people may say, well, I like matrices that have nice patterns in it. For example, the top right corner. You know, other people may say, I like matrices that only have non-zeros near this side, which we call the diagonal. So these are called banded matrices. Other people may say, I like these matrices that have the, this block structure. I mean, we start thinking about these matrices as living entities with their own properties, you know, and some we call really beautiful and, and others not. So I asked the students in my institute, what is your favorite matrix? And you may be completely surprised that, that this came out. Now, I don't know how many of you have looked at matrices like this. This is a Toplitz matrix, and they love this for very many various, uh, many reasons, but it also has a pattern in it. And then I asked, well, what is, what is the matrix you dread the most? What do you think they said? All zeros? Actually, matrix like this. You know, and, and this, these are matrix, these are really interesting matrices. They have some, some numbers in the matrix that are really, really big, and other numbers that are really tiny. And these matrices are actually very nasty when you work with them, because they can lead to all sorts of 
trouble on the computer with Roundoff. And matrices like this are called ill-conditioned matrices. See, we're really giving feel, you know, emotions to these things. These are ill-conditioned. So if, if somebody comes to, you come to ICME, to my institute, and they say, uh, oh, you're such an ill-conditioned person, then that's not a good thing, right? That means you fly off the handle with just the, the smallest perturbation, right? The, another term for that, by the way, is nonlinear, right? Don't be so nonlinear is what you hear around our institute very often. So, you know, as a mathematician or a linear algebra, we actually have most fun with matrices that are very, very big and ill-conditioned because they're very difficult to deal with. And we spend a lot of time writing computer programs um, to actually manipulate these matrices. Remember, the matrices underlie the, on the a system of equations. Often with system of equations, you want to solve these systems, and you can do that using matrices um, and specialized software. So this is just one example of a software package called SuperLU. Um, don't say mathematicians are not creative. You know, we think of interesting names. Uh, and this was developed at one of the laboratories close to Stanford by, uh, by a friend, Sherry. Okay, so now um, maybe uh, you're still not quite convinced that matrices are fun or useful. I don't know how many of you are. Some. Okay, but you probably have to say it because your instructor is down the... You know. <laughs> so let me talk a little bit more about matrices and particularly matrices related to the internet. So here is a small segment on how Google Googles, you know, to give you uh, a, a better idea of this. So let's, let's go back to Google search space and let's uh, search for Humboldt, okay? So if you search for Humboldt, you'll be very, very happy to see that Humboldt State University is the first term that comes up, right? Now, you have done this many, many times, I'm sure, yourself. And I don't know how many of you actually go to next pages or just look at the first page of results. Um, yeah, most people just look at this first page, right? And this is called search engine results page, the, the SERP. And these, this, of course, is exceedingly important. Now, how does Google come up with this? You see there were 48,900,000 results, and it took 0 0.52 seconds to get those results. Now, you may say, look, everybody searches for Humboldt every day, and so Google just stores those results, and then if you're the one searching next, then it just retrieves the information you already have and the outcome you already have. But you can think of all sorts of really f f uh, silly um, results to, or searches to do, for example, you can Google for me, and we, we used this example this morning, morning and, and Walden Friedman here, we've probably never been searched in connection, still it will only take zero point something seconds to come up with the results, right? And there are many, many, many results. Now the other thing that you see here is that um, all the results, these 48 million, are listed in some sort of order. So not only do we want to find websites that are relevant, but we also have to list them in importance. Behind this is all linear algebra, right? So sometimes when I, I teach linear algebra, I say to my students, that's a $50 billion course you're taking, right? Because the Google guys, they took linear algebra, actually they were contemporaries of mine at Stanford. I was in classes with them together, and I wish I'd just been much nicer to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't think they were, you know, all that approachable at the time. <laughs> so this was Google. So how about another website, Bing? Now, I, I have to come to the conclusion that Bing is not as good as a search engine as Google because it, it lists you second after Humboldt test equipment. Now, I really don't know how they do the ranking and why Humboldt test equipment would come up first. Um, but anyway... Websites have different, Google site or um, search engines have different results. So obviously they have some sort of way in which they decide to rank and that is not a universal way, right? So when you, when you think about this, you say, well, how does it determine the order? How does it find these related ma matches and what does it have to do with matrices? Now the ranking itself of these websites depend on many, many different factors. It depends on something called a page rank it depends on the number of visit, visits, the age of the page, the older the page, the better if there are recent edits. If it's an old page and there are no recent edits, then that's not good. And there's you know, many, many, many more. But the first one, the most important one, is the rank of a page. 
how to determine, and the rank of a page you should see as the importance of a page. Some pages are created differently than others, right? Not all pages have the same importance. You could argue, even though I don't like it, that CNN.com is a much more important page than margo.stanford.edu. I may argue with you about this, but you know, obviously many more people use it. So how does it determine the ranking of these web pages? So that when it comes up with results, it can say, okay, CNN.com has these search terms. Maybe I should put that first because that page is more important than margo.stanford.edu, right? So let's have a link, uh, look at, at, at PageRank. And PageRank, uh, that's actually what started Google. Now, when Larry and Sergey figured out a way to determine very, very quickly with m uh, methods and algorithms that were, had been in use for many, many years for other applications, how to find the importance of pages. And what they use is just links between web pages. So when you think about it, you know, here are three pages from your website, you know, HSU, and then the athletics page, and then a link to the softball page, and the softball page links back to this page, and the sports page also links back to the central page, right? So you have all these links pointing, clickable links pointing from page to page. Now you can think about it, hey, that's a clickable link, Right, or a button that a, a text that I can press on and I'll go to another web page and I put this in as an arrow. Okay, so if an arrow is directed from this page to that, it means that here there is a link I can click on that gets me there. Now you can think about outgoing links. So I can leave a page by clicking on this and have an arrow pointing somewhere else, I'm going out. And you can think about incoming links. And these are arrows pointing to me from other web pages. In other words, I have an incoming link if there is a web page somewhere that points to me, okay? And what Larry and Sergey did is they said, I can use just that, the incoming links, to decide how important I am. So how would it do that? Well, how would you do it if you can only use the incoming links? So first of all, if I have a web page that I set up and nobody refers to my page, my importance is going to be zero. Because nobody finds it important enough to create a link to me. You can argue about this. You can still think you're really important. But you can argue that this may be a good thing to do, right? If nobody finds you interesting enough to link to you, maybe your importance is not so high. Okay? So what do you think the, the importance depends on? How many pages link to me? But then you and I can make a deal, you know, or I can make a deal with all of you saying, you're tonight all going to put a link from your web page to mine, right? Then I have another 80 links coming to me, my importance will go up. And that, you wouldn't want that, right? Because then people can manipulate importance and can manipulate the ranking that they would have. So not only is it important to know how many pages link to you, but you really only want to be important if you have important pages linking to you, right? So if I'm linked to by CNN, wow, that's amazing, right? At least I could reason that. But what's the, what's the problem with that argument? Okay, so now maybe I have four incoming links. One of them is CNN, that's great. One of them is my son. Well, he's not super important. So I have, and, and, and one of them is Walden. Well, you're, of course, very important, but <laughs> sort of here. Um, but anyway, CNN seems great. But CNN doesn't just link to me, huh? CNN links to thousands of pages. So I'm just one of many thousands it links to. So maybe I'm not that important after all. You know, CNN is important, but it shares it in its importance with many, many websites, right? Because it links to many, many websites. And so when you start setting up a system that links these importances, you know, this is what you have to take into account. So here's another, here's that example, okay? So, <clears throat> you know, I actually do self-reference, so in, on my Facebook page, I reference to my website, okay? So that should really not be a very important link because it's self-reference. But I did have a link once from CNN, but CNN is linking out to so many websites, I mean, I'm just one of a million, and that's really not so great. So let's think about a very small internet to figure out how this works. So here is an internet with six websites, okay? That's all. And the arrows indicate 
these hyperlinks. So page two has a hyperlink to six. Six is what we call a selfish node because it doesn't point to anything, okay? Four and five have links to each other. So that has a name, we call them mutual admiration societies. All right, I point to you, you point to me, okay? One, what would you call one? Well, that's a very pitiful note because nobody links to one, All right? So what's the importance of one? Zero, okay? Now, one itself links to three pages. So here is how Sergey and Larry set this up. They said, if one had importance, then a third of that importance will go there, a third will go there, and a third will go there. Importance are shared out through these links, okay? And so with all this in mind, we can start setting up some equations. So we'll, let's play with this a little bit. Now, whenever we start talking about uh, values, we have to name them. And instead of using X, Y, Z, A, B, C, uh, I have six pages now. I'm going to call them X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, and X6. Okay, not a very creative naming system. But remember, X1 is the importance of page one and so on. So we see here X1 is zero because nobody is linking to X1. Okay, that was the pitiful note. But ignoring that for the moment, what would be x2? Okay, so x2 only has one incoming link from page one, okay? But one links out to three, so a third of its importance gets transferred to two. So x2 is a third x1. Yeah? Okay. But that was zero, but forget about that for now, because otherwise, you know, it, it, we'll see we have a very problematic, uh, very problematic program here because it all collapses. But anyway, for now, let's just write the equations, right? And this is exactly what you have to do in the web. You have to fix some things up because some things are broken here. But then X3, you get, see X3 gets uh, something from one, a third of its importance, and half of the importance of two because two shares between three and six. Does it make sense? Yeah? It's going to be test huh, at the end of the lecture. So that's for X3. Now, X4 and X5, they only point to each other. Um, so, oh, sorry, X5 only gets in from X4, so that's an equation. X4 gets from X1, X3, and X5 in this way, and X6 only receives from X2. So this is the system of equations, okay? Now, you may think, well, this is really crazy because it collapses. X1 is zero, X2, therefore, is zero, X3, therefore, is zero. This is zero, this was zero. X4 is X5, yep, we knew that because they were in this society together. X5 is X4, that's the same, and X6 is zero. So this is not a very interesting thing. You can't really work with this, right? So you have to fix, you have to fix this up. The other thing that makes this a little bit tricky is see that we have equations on this side, right? But on this side, sort of the unknowns, so all the importances you want to figure out, and on this side are also all the importances you want to figure out. So, you know, it's, it's a weird coupled system that you would have to solve. We know how to do this, though. Actually, Larry and Sergey, they, they did this with an old method called the Jacobi iteration. And they found out that if you had a system like this and you fix up exactly those three things I talked about, you don't allow six to be selfish, you don't allow nodes not to get anything, and you break up mutual admiration societies, all these things can happen on websites. You can have clusters of websites that only refer to each other, and so on. You do all of that, then you can solve this system, and you can solve it really, really fast. That was their Google idea. And they wrote a paper about this in 1997, and that was the basis of, of Google. So they saw two things, how to set up a system like this, and then how to fix this up so you can solve it. Okay, so now for those of you taking linear algebra, you will get to things like Jacobi iteration, and after you know this, then you can work with this. Okay, so we have equations. Of course, if we have equations, guess what? We have a matrix. This is the matrix corresponding to that. It's called the page rank matrix. And of course, the Google matrix like this is billions of rows and columns because there's so many different web pages. And you can imagine that you have to crawl a lot through you know, the internet to try to find all these links. Huh? So there's all these little creepy crawlers going around the internet, finding out all these links and creating 
these what we call page rank matrices. What do these matrices look like? Well, they may look like this. They're often clusters that you can see in them. So with these sort of matrices, you really start seeing clustering and, and you can analyze them. Now, it's a fixer-upper, as I said. These are the three things we have to fix up. And it's done really, really simply in most cases. Six is forced to link out. So after you set up your website, when you are in Google in this system of equations, Google can do with it whatever it likes, right? So it says, well, I just pretend that six links out. So it just creates links out of six. It says, OK, I just pretend that in, in my matrix. So and one simple way to do it is to let six link out to every other uh, website of the internet. Four and five can do the same. You can force five to link out somewhere. Not really, physically. You're not going to the website manager and said, you have to link out to something other than four. You just pretend it does by changing your matrix around. So Google is just fixing up the matrix in, uh, to make it what we would call irreducible and so on. And it's a perfect Markov process. And you had that in class today, right? You talked about Markov matrices. So that is what is done for this. And then one gets a contribution as well. So after this fixing up, and this is, for example, one step, um, everything works OK. So Google started with this. And it's all about matrices. They got inspired by this because they took a high-level linear algebra class on campus. Now, the thing is, this page, page rank matrix is absolutely massive. It's so massive. To maintain it is a huge amount of work. To compute the solution takes them forever, so they don't do it very often. OK, now in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this, the searches for a little bit. But if you want to know more about it, I can show you later. All right, so now how about this beauty? That's the last thing for tonight, OK? So usefulness for sure. Matrices and linear algebra comes up in almost everything that you do, right, on a daily basis. But how do you create art from it? So how did we create this? So here is a little thought experiment that may help explain this to you. And it just be a few minutes, and then, then uh, hopefully you understand. So here's a little matrix with ones and, and zeros. And I don't care where this comes from. Right? It could be any type of engineering applications or some sort of set of equations. I don't care where it's from. And I label all the rows in this table, you know, in this case from 1 to 4, and all the columns from 1 to 4 as well. Okay? And I say, OK. Each of these numbers, 1, 2, 3, and 4, they get associated with them a node. So I don't know if you can read the white on the blue, but these are four nodes, and they're labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4. And now every time I see a non-zero, for example, the 1 over there in the first row and the third column, I interpret that as a link between 1 and 3. Right? Now the 1 in that first you know, the first row and first column is a link between one and one. I cannot draw that. It's, you know, self-reference. I sort of ignore that. But the link between one and three, I put in this little system simply by a, an actual link like that. Okay, so one and three are connected. And I go through all of the rows. And for example, when I get to the third row, I connect three with one, okay, which I already had actually, but also three with four. And so I go through, and at the end of it, this is then a representation of this matrix. OK? So it's just, you can imagine, balls, you know, four balls in this case, because I had four rows and four columns, with a link between them. And maybe you can imagine these balls are like real physical balls, and between them is like a, maybe a rubber band. Okay? Have that visual in, in, your, in your head. Balls and rubber bands. Now, I can. This, you can think, well, this is kind of nice. This is a visualization, if you like, of this matrix, right? Is that a pretty visualization? Well, I don't know, but maybe this is nicer. So we could draw this also slightly different, exactly the same thing, but now we draw it like this. And you may think, oh, that's aesthetically more pleasing. But then we go to larger matrices, and you do this, and it may look like this. That's a complete mess. So you think, well, where the heck is she going? Well, now think about this. So uh, we have all these little balls, and there is a connection with other balls. Now let's assume these connections are rubber bands. So if there is a connection between those two balls, it wants to pull these balls closer together. OK? So remember, that was a non-zero in the matrix. It wants to pull these balls closer together. They're connected. They want to be together. 
But now you do something like this. You give these balls also a repelling charge. So maybe magnet, but the same polarity. So what happens when they get close? They start repelling. What happens if there is no elastic band between two balls? They want to be as far away from each other as possible. So now I have this complex matrix with all these connections. It's a complete mess, but I play this game. Now I have a physical system. I just let it sort of drop on the ground and see what happens. So the balls that are connected will go to each other, but when they're not connected by an elastic band, they will just repel each other. And then we see what happens, and this is what happens. So this is the actual simulation of how that works in physics. If we had repelling charges and we had these, um, these uh, elastic bands pooling. And you see that something that seems like a complete utter mess, right? Just these little balls, and every time there's a non-zero, you just draw a little line, now organizes itself. And you find a beautiful pattern that is somehow representative of this matrix, right? Now, this is how we create what you've seen. All these graphs are just like that, right? But some of them have many, many, many balls and many, many nodes. So this is one, for example, from a social network. And every single time you see a little dot, a little pixel of color is a ball. And a line is a rubber band, an elastic band, and this is how they organize each, uh, themselves. Now, is it easy to create these beautiful pictures? You have to play a little bit with the strength of the elastic bands and with the strength of the repelling charge, you can probably imagine. And if you start varying that, you can get pretty pictures or not so pretty pictures. And so some of these, they took a thousand attempts to get a nice picture, but you have to admit, it's pretty nice. Huh? And then when you look at something like this, you, you can sort of imagine this is a social network representation with clusters of people. Maybe this is a family or, you know, maybe this is HSU. Maybe HSU is right here smack in the middle, right? Connected with everything. Center of the universe, right? Um, this is one that was done on another musical segment where you're looking at Fourier decomposition of the music signal. You're looking at the matrix coefficient resulting uh, from that and then do it. This one here is, um, let's see, which one was this? This is a lung model exercise. So here we're looking at a, a physical model of airflow through the lungs. And when we look at the matrix that comes out of the system of equations, it starts to look like this, which actually is a little bit reminiscent of a lung, right? So that's interesting. You don't always get that lucky. This one is a financial portfolio analysis. So it's financial mathematics. Well, I never liked it very much, these portfolios, but when I looked at this, I said, oh, that's interesting. Now there's beautiful symmetry in this picture. Does it make sense from the mathematical problem? Yes, that's a very beautiful symmetric problem, and you can have clusters in this, and it really tells you something about the underlying mathematics. Not too much, but enough, you know, to still feel financial math is okay. This is a shallow ocean model. So this, com this comes from the simulation of flow in a very shallow bay. It looks very funny to me, like the globe, but still fun. This one is the Stanford Internet Matrix. Okay, so if you look at all the pages connecting to each other on the Stanford Internet, and you do this graph, you see this. Now, one of the things that you can see is that there are a lot of disjointed things. So these are clusters that are not linking out anywhere. This was the matrix before fixing up. So here are all these isolated or selfish clusters, these mutual admiration societies. Right there is central administration. They are connected to many things. I think my school is one of these supernovas there. right? And you can look at this, and actually from a picture like this, you can say your cluster, you know, your part of the university, is not sufficiently well connected to others uh, on the Internet. You know, you can do that with a graph like this. Uh, this one I completely forgot. I think it's MRI imaging. This one, oop, the, the spiky guy. Let's see if I can get it back. Sorry, some of these things are really uh, big, so it doesn't always work. That one that quickly came up, that's an electrical circuit one. Oh, there it is. So this is from electrical circuits, which I think is very funny because it's so spiky here, right? Because you're charged up. 
This one is the, no, oh, ah, sorry, something very funny. Of course, it's your problem with your system. Right? <laughs> okay, let's see if we can do this again. Just look really quickly because it may just come up. But the next matrix you're going to see is actually the matrix corresponding to the Bay Area simulation that I showed you earlier, that underlying matrix. This is what that looks like. And this is a matrix that uh, we put together. Oh, there it is again. So it looks a bit like a Bay system, not at all like the San Francisco Bay, but it's still uh, a fun thing to look at. And this one is uh, the... Uh, the graph that corresponds to the Library of Congress subject header matrix, which is, uh, you know, we worked on with the Library of Congress on this for a while to understand how all the items in the Library of Congress subject, um, uh, the catalog, how they were all connected. And we zoomed in here on this supernova that happens to be Japanese antiquities, where one cataloger had just one main category and everybody hanging off it and no crosslink. So this cataloger was in a lot of trouble when we showed this because obviously he hadn't done his homework and connecting parts of Japanese antiquity with each other. It was only connected to the main category. So they used this and the, in this galaxy, the way we build it, you can actually fly through. You can click on these links and figure out what it is and find connections and it's a lot of fun to, to play with that. Right, so I'm gonna stop here and thanks very much for staying with me so long. Um, uh, other numbers, of course, in matrices also, and you can say, well, if the number's really big, then the rubber band has a very, very uh, high stiffness. I mean, you can play with lots of these things like that, right? And put colors on, and so here, but I let the students do that. They, they play with this for hours and find the nicest, the nicest picture. But it makes beautiful art. We have it all over our institute, you know, this stuff. Uh, now, yes. can you automate this process? Can you find an algorithm that will tell you which one is pretty? When it's pretty, or even better, yep. predict which weights will make one that's pretty. We have one. It's called Amazon Mechanical Turk. No, I'm just joking. So we actually, <laughs> <laughs> we actually put it on Mechanical Turk to do that. Um, it's a really interesting question and one that we've been asking ourselves. Uh, but that's hard. The human eye is much better in picking this thing up. You know, I give a thousand images to a student. It goes through like this. You say, oh, that one I like. Now, very, very difficult to model that, but it's a really interesting, uh, really interesting problem. Of course, people work on this all the time, right? How do you find beauty? Is, is, are the mathematical criteria for that? I don't have the answer to it, no. Um, what is interesting, when you put it on Mechanical Turk, I don't know how many of you have tried this, but you can pay people from all over the world to look at things, and you give them per task maybe five cents or 10 cents, right? And they do as many tasks as possible in an hour to earn a living. So you get thousands of people testing these things out. And we did this with these images. So we put something like 10,000 images on Mechanical Turk and we had thousands of people look at them and they all picked out similar ones. Now the question is, how do we model that now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Yes. Could you explain a little bit about your intelligence work? Yeah. So it's just what? It's completely made up. Right? So we just assume that these balls have a repelling force on them. And you know how big we make that repelling force depends a little bit. You know, we play with that. It's completely made up. And then we write a big system. So now it just a movement, you know, it becomes some big ODE system actually that you can solve. And um, and and we just let it go. So it sorts itself out over time. It's a, literally, if you had a heap like that with all these balls forced together, then you let it go, it finds the position of minimal energy, right? And that's how it, uh, the system just reorganizes itself. So these, these, these movies are wonderful. Now here, this was a very small system, and you can really see this pulled together, and of course we took one that was quite dramatic. Um, and for these big systems, you don't always see very nice movies. It stays very chaotic for a very long time. And it also, these algorithms, they look for minima iteratively, so they're all over the place, you know, and, and it may take a very, very long time to converge. But at some point, you start seeing patterns emerge. Now, we waste a lot of hours just watching these, <laughs> these animations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, the, uh, the rubber bands are allowed to cross without tangles, is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and a lot of them keep crossed at the, at the end. Now, these were all two-dimensional pictures, 
but you could do similar things in three dimensions. And with the Library of Congress, that one, we really wanted to make that three-dimensional so that people could fly through and so on. But in 2D, it's much simpler. Now, there are people that developed codes to do this in three dimensions as well, but it's a little trickier, not always easy to see. So, moving back to like Google, right? Yeah. Any, any one of the search engines, you're interested in paying a buy at least, right? Yep. You decide where you want to put your priorities and that relationship. Yep. And No, it's a really interesting question because, you know, you always try to give people intuition for things. And, and getting mathematical intuition is always very hard. You know, and if I look at the system of equations just on a piece of paper, it doesn't mean much to me. You know, I say, oh, boy, that's a big system of equations. That's about as, you know, emotionally involved as you can get, right? But there is no beauty in that. You can really see patterns very easily unless, you know, you have special types of matrices like the banded ones I showed or the block matrices I showed, and they tell you something about physics. But what, we, what I do, I mean, it's very hard to say, look, this particular type of visual is connected to this particular property of a matrix. It, it's almost impossible to say because there's so many different visuals you can create out of the same matrix. But what I have found is that the students that play a lot, so the answer is you play. You play and play and play. These students see hundreds of these matrices, right, and, and play with them. And then by the, by the end of it, they, they tend to get a feel. Now, sometimes they think they see something that relates to the physics in it, but you know that's just not true. Um, but graph analysis and this graph matrix connection is used by a lot of people in graph theory. And when you have these graphs and you can display them really well, then you can start looking at depth of graphs and the number of connectivity, sort of degree of separation, if you like, between nodes. And all these things are really, really important to, to understand. So, and that becomes more well, easier for the students to see. So they're gaining it by experience. Usually, yeah. yeah. So not theory, the book. Well, the graph theory is an incredibly rich and complex field. And so a lot of that is, is known. And so if, once you can translate the matrix to the graph, then you're, you, know, you're quite, you can do a lot of things that you can do in graph theory. Um, but for the visual displays, you know, discerning um, physical properties from that or system properties, that's, that's tough. You know, that's, we'd like to say that this is important, but really for most of us, it's just creating pretty pictures and slightly more sophisticated than painting by numbers, right? We'll take one more, sure. Uh, give me a very short answer. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure there are a lot of engineering examples. You have a lot of uh, differential equation and all other engineering high-tech stuff behind. Uh, but especially two pictures you showed us, uh, the uh, social, security, social network thing, Facebook stuff, and the uh, uh, library review of Congress uh, thing, that those four pictures just look awfully similar to what statistics uh, big data uh, plots uh, can, big data analysis uh, plots can do. Uh, is it, I'm sure deep down in statistical graph, uh, there is a matrix, of course, yeah. everything is matrix. Uh, um, the way you probe, you probe them, they get very different from, do you happen to know if the way you created those pictures are very different from what a commercial big data statistics software can do? Uh, th this particular visualization I have not seen used much. Okay, so when they do graph visualization in those cases, they use other types of, of software. Uh, but you know, deep down, it's all the same stuff, right? It's all, all matrices, so. That's why the end results are awfully similar. Yeah, they are. You know, it's all graphs, you know, yeah. I'm looking at the spy plot and it seeps right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be, a, yeah. That's, you know, we can get some rubber bands and put some. <laughs> if you too many zeros, like I wouldn't <laughs> say it was a sparse. <laughs> okay, let's give our speaker one more.